But these corporations who also benefit from owning politicians that help them get more money by increasing the war budget every year, don't call themselves war corporations. No, they call themselves defense contractors, services to purchase when defending a democracy no one asked you to defend. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, before we get into this week's episode, uh, I just want to let you guys know that if you enjoy uh, the content that I am putting out, uh, whether it's these Forkful of Noodles videos, whether it's my uh, interview podcast, Taboo Table Talk, the dispatches, the road reflections, uh, the live streams, wh whatever it is, if you, if you find some uh, value out of it, uh, one big thing that you can do to help independent media such as this channel here is by hitting the like button, hitting the share button, and making sure you are subscribed to the channel. That's how we subvert and get around the censorship that channels like mine see pretty consistently. The other way you can help if you're on stable financial ground is to uh, make a donation or become a sustaining member by making monthly contributions. Uh, you can do that directly on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Thank you guys so much. And I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Now, manipulating the working class is only one part of the puzzle. The military industrial complex has also taken over the government. With the inclusion of the military establishment of the Pentagon, almost every member of Congress and the Department of Defense, they, uh, the MIC dictates how America is governed and what it legislates on its behalf. Congress people are pretty ignorant to how much influence the war industry has on American culture and society. A lot of it has to do with them being out of touch millionaires. Even members of certain committees like the armed services and intelligence communities only focus on profit and information one-upsmanship. It's like if a Tom Clancy novel was as boring as a John Grisham novel. <laughs> you get it. You get it. They're all boring. They're all boring. The hunt for red October. The hunt for where's my red pillow, huh? You 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 get it because it's because it's yeah you get it. And look, and thanks to the Citizens United decisions from the Supreme Court, war corporations can now own politicians and dictate larger budgets for the MIC. The primary way these politicians end up giving the military such extraordinary budgets is because the war industry uses lobbyists to bribe them. I'm, I'm sorry, legally bribe them. And if you're concerned whether that's an oxymoron or not, you, you, you're, you're right. It, it, is an, it is an oxymoron for, for sure. And oxymoron is the perfect description of how the American government operates. Now, Jimmy Williams, a former lobbyist, describes what the job of a lobbyist is and how it purchases politicians. He says, years of legalized bribery exposed me to the worst elements of this country. Unlimited expense accounts, nights out on the town, expensive bottles of wine, etc. Endless cycles of money trading hands for votes. Every time a bill passed, or better yet, killed, I think to myself, that wouldn't have worked if I hadn't bought the outcome. Really, if you're a successful long-term lobbyist, you're likely a sociopath who only believes in money. And and yes, I'm 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 saying that is a bad thing. Okay, look, friends don't let friends drive a sociopathic billionaire's profit higher and higher. It's just not what good friends do. And all of this is to make sure that more and more money is budgeted for the military, the Department of Defense, and the Pentagon. In order to get an astro astronomically insane amount of money, these departments underestimate their costs. And then when new equipment and modifications and upgrades come up, the cost goes way up. And without these modifications, the American military, aka the world's largest military, will fall behind on these advancements. Right? 
I mean, if that sounds oxymoronic, you'd be right again. And once these departments get the money, they have to spend it all. Otherwise, they don't get the same amount or more next year. Good. You know what? I'm glad the war budget operates the same way as a Division D college's student activity budget, because hiring an entertainer to ensure college students aren't nonstop sexing each other is exactly on the same level of importance as fucking warfare. But this need to spend money is why the Pentagon has failed every single audit it's ever gone through in the history of the Pentagon. And this has become such a standard that the whole country would shut down if the Pentagon actually passed an audit. Right? What do they? What do they do? Are they? Holy shit! Did they? Did they tell the truth? How? How the fuck did this happen? We just lose our minds. As Routers reported, the Defense Finance and Accounting Service has to cook the books in order to make this appear like it's normal. The reality is, we don't know how much money the Pentagon actually spends on anything it needs. This is a mystery even Scooby-Doo and his gang can't solve. And boy, and boy, howdy, those kids, they, they solved quite a, a lot of mysteries, a lot of mysteries. Now, something we do know is the DOD and the Pentagon uses the services of the War Corporations of America. These corporations are publicly traded companies, which means that people can own stock in how popular merchants of death are. Investment banks and asset management firms have stocks in these companies. And this is how Wall Street operates, making money out of more money by selling death. But these corporations who also benefit from owning politicians that help them get more money by increasing the war budget every year, don't call themselves war corporations. No, they call themselves defense contractors, services to purchase when defending a democracy no one asks you to defend. Okay, and these defense contractors fabricate, test, evaluate, qualify, assemble, market, inspect, package, deliver, sustain, maintain, and redesign projects, products, and build those who, who use these services they manufacture the demand for. And since these contractors have no national loyalty, they sell to anyone and everyone that they can. 74% of the nations America considers undemocratic and authoritarian receive weapons from these defense contractors and military aid from America. These, the, the Defense Security and Cooperation Agency is the intermediary, intermediary that helps these war corporations sell weapons to foreign nations while operating within U.S. borders. London, Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, and Tel Aviv are some of their customers. Now, their, their claim is they're using it for self-defense, but we know in the case of Tel Aviv and Riyadh, these American weapons are used to oppress the people of a different nation. And these customers or wars are the aggressors in this situation, not the defenders. But using the propaganda wing of the arms industry, the U.S. manufactures the, quote, right side of history. This practice of selling weapons to nations that actively violate human rights on a daily basis was normalized by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR signed the Quincy Pact in 1945 with Saudi Arabia that lets the, the U.S. surround Saudi Arabia with military bases and give preferential treatment to U.S. corporations for the infinite use of the American military by the Saudi royals. So. In order to ensure high profitability, America, a faux champion of human rights, chose one of the worst nations for human rights to be its partner in the Middle East. Further proof that there is no moral high ground for America and its military. Saudi Arabia has used American-backed force to attack and destroy Yemen. So far, over 233,000 people have died in Yemen, and the Biden administration approved an offensive at the start of their term. But war corporations don't take responsibility for what their customers do with their products. War profiteers distance themselves from the death and destruction of their products because they, quote, they're not the ones firing the missiles. Okay, 
Uh, name like one other purpose for a missile. Oh, hold on. Name one non-sexual secondary purpose for a missile. There aren't any other purposes for a bomb other than to explode, destroy, and kill. H hence, regardless of how much distance you put, if you make a killing cool tool, regardless of who fires it, its created intent is and always will be to kill. And as its manufacturer, you're responsible for this weapon you sold to maniacs that are going to use it for its intended purpose. This is a basic level of knowledge, which, when accepted, will ensure that you, as a war profiteer, will never sleep at night again, primarily because you'll be haunted by the ghosts of the billions of people you've killed to be a rich bitch. And this distance is created in the way these corporations market themselves. They say they're, quote, providing solutions to our customers. Solutions to what? How do you erase your fingerprints in destabilization of a prospering socialist democracy and installing a terror cell inside that nation? Raytheon's Freedom Bundle will take care of that for you. Rain down some hellfire missiles and say goodbye to the drought of sovereignty that's held these countries back for decades. Raytheon, fuck your democracy. We'll buy you a new one. So... What are the solutions they're claiming they provide? Well, they claim they're providing digital information and, quote, innovative solutions. What fun new ways of saying genocide. If you're unsure of what side you need to be on as an American, always choose the genocide. Raytheon, because fuck you if you think your vote matters. OK, look, I, I know that's a dark joke. But if you're offended, remember that actual genocide is a lot darker than my wordplay. At least my wordplay didn't drop a bomb on a wedding. But in some instances, war corporations work together to make one product for the military. The MQ-9 drone has components made by at least six different war profiteers. Honeywell made the engine. Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and Raytheon built the weapons, weaponry and armaments. And the L3 Harris uh, made the targeting system. I mean, gee, I wonder what improvements we could have made to a high-speed rail system or any other modes of transportation if uh, we could use this technology uh, to do anything other than slaughter black and brown people across the globe. Just a thought. But the world corporations don't only sell weapons as part of their, quote, innovative solutions. They also sell soldiers. Soldiers of fortune, that is. These mercenaries, who also brand themselves as contractors, are hired in part to save the rich. If there was a draft instated, the sons and daughters of corporate and political elites would be off to war. So the mercenaries get hired to hyper-privatize the already privatized war industry. And this, in turn, helps the military get a higher budget since they had to purchase the mercenaries. The other purpose they serve is to make the U.S. military look better than it is. Mercenaries are used to make sure uh, uniform troop casualties are kept at a minimum. If there are more mercenaries than soldiers, that means there will be more mercenary casualties and fatalities than soldiers. So the military looks like it's succeeding and is far more powerful than it actually is. I mean, logically, wouldn't the easiest way to do that is well, I don't know, like not have such a massive military, not have an industry that perpetuates nonstop war, death and destruction all the time. But logic goes out the window when the question, well, how do you make expect to make money comes into play? Instead, the war industry found a loophole to make money and send more working class people to their debts for the sake of someone else's profit. Now that we've uh, covered some of the more exciting products sold by the merchants of death. Let's go into some of the more mundane ones. The base operation support services or boss huh, are services that used to be done by the soldiers. Things like facility management, cooking and janitorial services. You know, your more mundane day to day tasks. Fake martial artist and A1 creep Steven Seagal actually played a boss employee in Under Siege and the direct VHS release of Under Siege 2, The Seasoning. 
But in Under Siege 3, the siege won't stop, can't stop. Seagal played a civilian who has to take up arms to save a, a baby or something. It was it was a really confusing direct to YouTube movie. There was a uh, it, it really it really just felt like it was Stephen and uh, may, maybe a couple people that owed him a favor. Uh, the plot really didn't make it was it was confusing. Don't watch it. Just uh, just do yourself a favor and don't watch it. Look, trillions of dollars has been spent by the military industrial complex to manufacture a permanent state of war so business can continue to boom as other nations go boom. If we even take a fraction of that amount and redistribute that to healthcare, education, housing, utilities, and internet services, we'd uplift every single American's lives. And as a mega bonus, no one had to die to do it. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you did, if you did, uh, please give it a thumbs up uh, and please share this out with as many friends as you can. Share it with some friends, share with some enemies, share with anybody that you feel uh, would benefit from from hearing content like this that, that maybe you can have a conversation with. Uh, that's that's always the hope is that uh, you can you can share this with some folks and 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 start a dialogue. Maybe maybe learn some different perspectives, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I do have some uh, show dates coming up. Some show dates, some virtual shows, um, uh, some Forkful of Noodles recordings where you can be a part of a virtual audience for Forkful of Noodles. And I have some in-person uh, show dates coming up as well. Uh, I'm going to be performing my uh, new stand-up comedy hour, Citizen Revolution, um, in some select places over the winter. And then I'll be going on tour uh, in 2020, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm also performing my stand-up show virtually over Zoom. So if you want to be in the audience for any of those things, um, you can go directly to my website to grab tickets. That's krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. I've got a couple of virtual shows to round out the year. And then I'm, I'm kicking back into doing monthly forkful of noodles recordings uh, at the uh, at the beginning of the year as well. So I'm very excited to get back into those. Again, you can find tickets and details for all of the shows that are coming up on my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, while you're there, you can grab a stand-up comedy album. You can check out past episodes of my show. You can sign up for my email list. Uh, you can become a sustaining member, get free tickets to virtual shows and live shows when I come to your city, uh, plus a bunch of other cool bonus exclusive content as well. Uh, so tons of stuff uh, to do right on the on the website. So again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again to the people that uh, consistently support the show by sharing, by watching, by liking, by leaving, uh, leaving really cool and awesome comments. Um, and to and to those folks that uh, that do become sustaining members as well, uh, you guys are amazing. You guys help keep uh, keep the show going. Keep keep me keep me working as 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 hard as I do and and sharing the content uh, that I really really love and enjoy to share. Uh, so with all of that said and done, uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.